Hello, and welcome to I Know Dino, the, the Big, Big Dinosaur, Dinosaur Podcast, Podcast, where we cover news, interviews, and discussions of all things dinosaur. Hello and welcome to I Know Dino. I'm Garrett. And I'm Sabrina. And today's episode is brought to you by TRX Dinosaurs. They have innovative dinosaur art, specifically affordable, poseable dinosaur sculptures and puppets, as well as animatronics. And you can find out more by going to trxdinosaurs.com or going to Instagram at trxdinosaurs. This week, we have Dinosaur of the Day, Augustina Lofus. We have a bunch of dinosaur news. And as always, we would like to thank some of our Stegosaurus patrons. This week, we would like to thank Lucas and Eli, Wyatt, the Georges family, John Heck, Lindsay Burns, and Janice. Yes, big thanks to this group of people and all of our Stegosaurus patrons and all of our patrons in general. We have a few different options on our page. If you're curious, you should check it out at patreon.com slash I know Dino. Yep, lots of good stuff on there, especially us. <laughs> so jumping right into the news, the first article I want to talk about is a little bit heavy but it's something that we've been talking about a lot lately, and that's Ornithocelida, or Ornithoscalida, depending on how you want to say it. And there's a follow-up on the original paper. It was written by Luke Perry, as well as Matt Barron, who we talked to about it. But Luke Perry is actually the lead author, which I thought was interesting, since Barron was the original creator of this hypothesis. I guess he's trying to get more people involved, which makes sense. Mm -hmm. Bigger and, discussion. Yeah. As well as Jacob Vinther was also a contributing author. So just as a quick recap, Ornithocelida is an alternative sort of classification of dinosaurs to Ornithischia and Saurischia. And Ornithocelida includes both theropods and Ornithischians, whereas historically... Theropoda is within Saurischia, so it's kind of pulling them out and then lumping them together with Ornithischians into this new group con called Ornithocelida, and then leaving sauropods and a couple other guys on their own. So in the new paper, they used Bayesian analysis to look at their model and look at how they classify dinosaurs, and Matt Barron actually hinted at that when we interviewed him, and it ended up supporting Ornithocelida as its own group yet again. So it's really just one more piece of evidence supporting the idea that the original classification of dinosaurs as Ornithischia and Saurischia is probably an oversimplification. And they point out in their paper, too, that some of the criticisms of their paper, although they may not have come up with the exact same group of Ornithocelida, still didn't exactly wind up with Ornithischia and Saurischia. So whether or not you end up with Ornithocelida or Ornithoscalida, you probably aren't going to end up with the original classifications that were guessed at based on just a few dinosaurs all those years ago. Which makes sense. I think it does. They also referenced Pachypotosauria in the paper, which I like. That was the group that Thomas Holtz recommended using instead of calling them sauropoda and herrerasaurids and stuff. Because when you're tearing up this whole Ornithischia saurischia history, it kind of makes sense to make it a new group. I like that. There haven't been any comments on the page. There's a little comment section at the bottom because it was published in Royal Society Open Science, like on a lot of websites, especially blogs, you know, there's comments at the bottom and there were zero comments. So then I tried At least of this, as of this recording. Yeah, but it's been out for a little while. It's been out for a couple of weeks. And I searched around, too, to try to find any sort of controversy or, you know, pushback. But I couldn't really find much. Even on Twitter, it was just kind of like, yeah, hey, there's this new paper. So I'm hoping that there'll be some pushback and we can kind of get the other side of the story. There hasn't been a whole lot so far, though. But that might just be because there isn't a lot to push back on. I don't know. Mm -hmm. We'll have to see. One thing I thought was interesting was there was one person on Twitter that mentioned another group should do an independent analysis and try to see what they come up with when they individually score all these elements 
But like when we talked to Matt Barron, it took years basically going through all these different dinosaur bones and classifying different lengths of different parts and all these different features of bones so that you can run them through a computer model to try to extrapolate how these dinosaurs evolved. So there isn't a whole lot of incentive for people to try to replicate that work. Because if you end up proving the same thing, you know, you're not publishing a real exciting paper and the whole motivation behind a lot of research is to publish new exciting papers. So duplication efforts are usually pretty low, unfortunately, even though that's the best way to do science is to try to duplicate things other people have done. Mm -hmm. So we'll see. Maybe someone will take up the banner and try to do it. This is a pretty big deal, so I would hope so. Yeah. Still pretty new. There are a couple of exciting dinosaur trackways that have been in the news lately. One of them is from the Nemect Formation, and it was actually the first theropod trackway found there. It was published by Hang J. Lee and others. And really, the Nemect Formation is the major formation in Mongolia. There's tons of dinosaur finds coming out of there all the time. And in this find, they found dozens of prints going in multiple directions from four different types of theropod. So it's a really cool trackway. They also found a Gallimimus foot in the area, although it's in a lower layer than the layer that has all the footprints in it. Hmm. So it's not really clear if the Gallimimus was walking around leaving these footprints or if it just happened to kind of die in the same area. <laughs> And it's not even really clear exactly when it died, because since only the foot was found, they propose that the foot might have actually kind of pushed through that earlier layer where the footprints were. So if you imagine, you know, if you're standing in dirt, your feet could sink into it depending on how soft the dirt is, and you might push past a layer of dirt that had these footprints in it, or you might not. Kind of hard to say. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, it appears that the site was looted by poachers, and they basically collected all of the Gallimimus except for the foot. So we lost a lot of really valuable information, and it made it harder to tell if the Gallimimus was around in the same layer as the footprints, because if it's just that foot that pressed through to a different layer, maybe the rest of its body would have been on the layer with the footprints, mm -hmm. but we really can't tell because it's been all ruined by poachers so it's just another example of why these poachers and people that basically steal fossils from public land kind of damage the scientific pursuit and also you know it's a really valuable thing that people there could have learned from but now they can't the gallimimus probably wasn't mired <laughs> they use that word quite a bit in the paper to mean that it didn't get stuck there like in a quagmire kind of thing. They think that because of a couple of reasons. For one, the foot is kind of on its side. So if it's laying down, you wouldn't expect it to be kind of trapped. And then another factor is that the footprints don't look deep enough. They look like they were probably made on relatively hard sediment and therefore you wouldn't be getting stuck in it. So they think that the Gallimimus probably died because of thirst or hunger or an unknown reason. <laughs> Anything but a flood. Yeah, basically, because the sediment itself can kind of give you clues for floods, and that wasn't present either. So, pretty interesting. You really don't see a lot of footprints with fossils preserved nearby. They tend to be different types of sediment that preserve footprints versus fossils. So it's neat to see the two fossilized in the same area. Another big fossil footprint discovery came from Lesotho in southern Africa, and the title explains it as the first megatheropod tracks from the lower Jurassic Upper Elliot Formation in the Karoo Basin. Oh yeah, and all the headlines around this were, there were big dinosaurs in the Jurassic. Jurassic Park was right. Oh, yeah, it was so annoying. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I, uh, uh. <laughs> oh, didn't mean to bring up anything there. <laughs> but it's, yeah, Jurassic Park wasn't even about that. I don't know. It's just, that was so frustrating. 
everything's got to be controversial in headlines these days. It's like they're just making up a controversy. I think it's just point. because the big dinosaurs in Jurassic Park would have lived in the Cretaceous. Yes, at least T Rex. But no one's saying that it's a T Rex. People aren't even saying it's a Tyrannosauroid. So I don't get the connection. But what they did find was some trackways that mostly look like Eubrontes or Kayantopus. I don't know if I'm saying that one right because I couldn't find the etymology anywhere. But Eubrontes, you might be familiar with because we've talked about it quite a bit in the past. There's a lot of them in the northeastern U.S. It's potentially a Dilophosaurus. And like I said, they're common all over the U.S. and North America in general. The Kayantopus has really long skinny digits compared to Eubrontes, at least in this trackway. And it reminds me of like a duck foot, but without the webbing. You know how they have those really long skinny digits Mm -hmm. and they're kind of splayed out almost as wide as they are long. They describe it as a, quote, gracile tridactyl track, which is a nicer way to say it than duck print without webbing. (laughs) But they say that it's likely because of a firm substrate that they have this kind of appearance to them. So like the whole foot pad wasn't sinking into the mud. It was just kind of leaving a light impression along the middle of the digit kind of thing. The footprints are really big of these Kayantopus. They were about 57 centimeters or almost two feet long. And they estimated that the dinosaur would have been about nine meters or 30 feet long and about 2.7 meters or nine feet tall at the hips. So that is a pretty massive dinosaur. But it doesn't make it T-Rex size. It makes it Allosaurus sized. (laughs) (laughs) And there have been Allosauroid teeth found in the area. And although it would be pretty early for an Allosaurus, there are some other indicators that there might have been Allosauroids in the area. But the authors point out that really we haven't seen much in the way of large carnivores from the early Jurassic in southern Africa. So it is a pretty cool find. It definitely doesn't overturn anything. We already knew about dinosaurs this size in North America. So it's not like, oh, Jurassic Park was actually right. It's like, yeah, we knew these dinosaurs were around then, just not in Southern Africa. Struck a nerve. (laughs) It's just so annoying. Um, (laughs) But it is something new in that we didn't know they were in the area. And it has some implications for what kind of what the herbivores would have had to deal with and other animals that are trying not to get eaten. I would say all animals try not to get eaten. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) Good point. (laughs) But hopefully we'll find some actual fossil evidence. I mean, and by that I mean fossilized bones rather than just fossilized footprints, because that really tells you a little bit more about which animal it is. And there's also some Ankylosaurus news which I have to talk about because Ankylosaurus is the best dinosaur. Not the best, but it's pretty good. It's the best. (laughs) (laughs) This one was written by Victoria Arbor and Jordan Mallon, and they published a basically an update on the Ankylosaurus anatomy. So it's partially a review of many Ankylosaurs, and what they show is that Ankylosaurus is huge. We kind of already knew that. So it's likely about 8 meters or 26 feet long, which is really long compared to other ankylosaurs. That's almost as big as that theropod. Exactly. But definitely a lot more heavily built. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. For comparison, Zool is about 6 meters, and that's probably the next biggest ankylosaur that we've found. And they estimated that it weighed about 4.8 tons, or about 4,000 kilograms, And based on the biggest known Ankylosaurus skull, that individual would have been about eight tons or about as massive as a large African male elephant, which is the largest land animal around today. (laughs) Hmm. So aside from its huge size, there are a few other interesting things about Ankylosaurus that they pointed out. For one thing, it had a really huge head, but unusually small teeth for its huge head. (laughs) <laughs> that would have looked funny. Yeah. Well, I mean, all the teeth were so small. They're like millimeter scale, like 10 millimeter. So you might not notice by looking at so it. It might look like it had no teeth. Yeah, they would all kind of look like it, that. But they did a little graph of 
the millimeters of teeth size versus the size of the skull. And really the other ankylosaurs all kind of scale along a line. And then you've got ankylosaurus, which is way off to the size with these tiny teeth for its huge head. <laughs> and they don't really know why. They hypothesize that maybe it's because it was eating small invertebrates and therefore it didn't need bigger teeth. Or maybe it was eating fruiting bodies, which I think they're talking about angiosperms that were evolving around then. So, you know, they were changing their teeth to match that new diet. But whatever the case was, they weren't eating the same kinds of things as the other ankylosaurs, it appears, because otherwise you'd expect their teeth to kind of scale in the same way. They also put some effort into updating the armor. They showed three previous versions of Ankylosaurus armor. The first one was brown back in 1908, and there it's like armadillo style, just huge bony bumps all over the place covering its whole back. And a lot of it is connected together so that it would have been inflexible around the hips. Mm -hmm. Then the next one that they show isn't until 2003, so almost 100 years later, when Ford showed much less dense armor so that it might be a little bit more flexible, but it still had that kind of inflexible hip. And then Carpenter, a year later, revised it, showing kind of a more gracile body. Its armor wasn't connected around its hip anymore, but they showed larger bony plates around the shoulders. And then in this paper, they show it the way that I typically see ankylosaurs depicted, with kind of a rounder body. There's a bit of distance in between the bony plates. And the area around the shoulders is fused together, which is actually what we saw with Borealopelta, where those are really the part where it's kind of jammed together. The most armor is the most severe and everything. So I think they're kind of building on all that because we don't have a lot of postcranial remains for Ankylosaurus. So we have to infer all of this information from other Ankylosaur finds. And given that Ankylosaurus is so weird, <laughs> Compared to other ankylosaurs, <laughs> you might question whether or not you can do that kind of thing. It's weird that it's weird. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so hopefully it's just the teeth that are weird and we can still infer the rest of its body. They also really amped up the size of the tail club, assuming that it being so massive would have had kind of a massive tail club to match. Hmm. So, Or maybe it was like its teeth size. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that they didn't scale normally. Yeah. Yep. But it's a really cool paper. They go into a lot of detail about ankylosaurs. So if you're into ankylosaurs, you should check it out. There's also some really pretty pictures. Victoria always does good drawings of the horns on the different ankylosaurs. And this one also has the addition of the armor, which is fun to see. Cool. Next, Westchester Magazine published a piece called What Did Westchester Look Like During the Age of Dinosaurs? And it's a really fun piece to read. It paints this picture of dinosaurs in the area based on fossils that have been found there and explains how the climate was much warmer. And Westchester probably would have been on the eastern shore of a broad lake that ran south to Maryland and Virginia, or at least what's now Maryland and Virginia. <laughs> Obviously didn't exist back then. So then it moves on to the Jurassic period where there would have been a lot of theropods in the area, possibly of Dilophosaurus as well as prosauropods. That's cool. And then moving on to the Cretaceous, there would have been Hadrosaurus and the Tyrannosaur Dryptosaurus. And the article, what I really liked about it is it's told kind of like a story. And then there's also this fun timeline and illustrations of dinosaurs in present day White Plains. <laughs> so overall, interesting read. I like what they did with it. Pop Chart Lab has a new dinosaur taxonomy poster that portrays over 700 genera of dinosaurs in one infographic. Ooh. I know, I was thinking maybe, maybe we should get it. <laughs> it took apparently 500 hours of research to design, and the data comes from current classification systems, including the Ornithoscolida group, which Garrett talked about already. Interesting. I'm surprised that they included that. Yeah, I wonder how many of the hours of the 500 hours it took for that. <laughs> or if they got like 400 hours in and they realized that and had to start over again. <laughs> <laughs> There's also 100 hand-drawn illustrations, and they include some of the favorites. There's Triceratops, T-Rex, Cetacosaurus, 
The poster is 24 inches by 36 inches, and it costs $37, and you can buy it online. We'll post a link in case you want one, too. That sounds cool. Mm -hmm. All that work for only 37 bucks. Sounds like a good deal when you look at it that way. (laughs) Yeah. Unfortunately, it's probably going to be outdated by the time it's printed, because those things are constantly changing. Oh, I think it's printed. Then it's probably already outdated. Well, like you were talking about with that new paper. Yeah. Yeah. Things are constantly changing. I've thought about making my own version of one of these. And then as soon as I start trying to research making a huge tree, I find conflicting things in new <laughs> papers and then I just give up because yeah. it's, it changes too quickly. I think in another like 30 years, maybe 40 years, once <laughs> things settle. Yeah. Things are a little more established. We stop finding new dinosaurs constantly. That might be a better thing to do in print. <laughs> what if we never stop finding new dinosaurs? constantly if that's the worst case scenario i'm okay with it yeah (laughs) (laughs) so speaking of dinosaur merch i want to thank eric and lauren who both shared about this one with us via patreon so for those of you who watched stranger things 2 on netflix you may have noticed that the character dustin henderson wore a brontosaurus hoodie in the first episode and yes it was a brontosaurus not a potosaurus but anyway (laughs) Apparently, that hoodie was sold in the Science Museum of Minnesota's Explore store back in the early 1980s, and now the museum is selling an authentic limited edition of the hoodie, as well as t-shirts. Yeah, and you could actually see the Science Museum of Minnesota written on the bottom of his shirt, but I didn't notice it (laughs) when I was watching it. I just noticed the brontosaurus part of it. I don't think it was really on screen for that long where you would notice. Yeah. But... People apparently went crazy for it. Well, first, I just want to point out that it's interesting. It was Brontosaurus when it was made in the 80s, back when we thought Brontosaurus wasn't a thing. Yeah, Minnesota. And now it's back. Yeah. So it's all good. (laughs) Yeah, that's true. But yeah, on November 7th, shortly after the museum opened their online sales, at 8 a.m. Central Time, their website crashed because so many people were trying to buy these shirts and sweatshirts. And the site was back up by 11 a.m. And then by 4 p.m. that day, Central Times, they had sold 10,000 items, the hoodies and shirts, for $400,000. And their store, Explore Store, was sold out by noon. So pretty crazy. (laughs) Apparently they're getting more in stock. So you can try buying them online or visiting the museum if you're in St. Paul, Minnesota. Prices range $15 to $40. We'll see how long inventory lasts. Yeah, I'm assuming that if you buy it online, they probably just keep making them, whereas buying it in the store would be a lot more difficult. That's what they said in the email that they sent out. Mm -hmm. One of my sisters is a member of that museum, and she forwarded the email to me, and it was like, it reminded me of an advertisement for tickets to a concert that are about to go on sale. Yeah. And it's like, buy them quickly. You're best off trying to buy them this way because we expect them to go fast and we can't guarantee stock and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> Online's where it happens now, where everything happens now, because the reason that even appeared in Stranger Things too was that the costume designer, Kim Wilcox, had found the original hoodie online. She was looking <laughs> for period clothing items and they bought it for the show and then they made a purple one for the actor yeah it looks very 80s Mm -hmm. because it's got that tail resting on the ground look to it and everything and it's just that plain yellow colored skeleton with yellow print and then you know on a solid background shirt yeah and purple it really adds to the 80s-ness I guess people just like it because of nostalgia or maybe they're just really big Stranger Things fans there's a lot of Big fans. Yeah. Yeah. In other TV news, Idaho Public Television has an original series called Science Trek, which apparently has been going on for 19 years. Jeez. Yeah. Oh, 19 seasons still. And this month they're releasing a series of digital shorts on dinosaurs. So that's cool. In the series, they visit the Museum of Idaho. They meet Sue the T-Rex. They learn about different prehistoric animals. There are six shorts. I think at least one of them's been released as of this recording. The first one's called Dinosaur Basics, and that's about the Museum of Idaho and how they put together a traveling version of Sue the T-Rex. Next is Finding Dinosaurs in Idaho, about the hunt for a dinosaur in Idaho. 
Then there's Eating and Eggs, which explores dinosaur eggs and how much a T-Rex could swallow in one bite. Hmm. The fourth short is called Survived, and that's about how other animals lived alongside dinosaurs. The fifth one is called Hops, which talks about the two dinosaur groups, at least the ones we've been talking about <laughs> the last 130 years. This keeps coming up. So they talk about the Sauriscians and Ornithischians. <laughs> not Ornithoselida. No, that's not in there. And then the last one is plates and what we don't know. And that's about where dinosaurs lived and then the things we don't know yet about dinosaurs. So these shorts and the other, I guess, episodes that Science Trek makes is meant for pre-K to 12 educators to use. And the videos are all available for free online and we'll post a link. You can watch the series. BBC created a pretty interesting video. It answers the question, what did dinosaurs taste like? And we may have talked about it before and speculated, well, maybe they tasted like chicken since they're birds, but BBC begs to differ. Well, first they argue that if non-avian dinosaurs weren't extinct, they may have been farmed for food. Could be. Carnivores tend to not taste that good, so they probably wouldn't have farmed the carnivores. No. They said that they probably would have farmed titanosaurs, if that were the case. Interesting. Because you get the most meat or something. I don't, I don't, it seems like it would be hard to farm titanosaurs yeah. because they're so large. I think hadrosaurs would probably be easier. The cows, yeah. those cows. Yeah. <laughs> but also, let me finish with different dinosaurs, they said, would have tasted different. And we can get clues on how they tasted based on fossils and comparisons to modern animals. So not all dinosaurs then would have tasted like chicken, and they think titanosaurs would have tasted like beef. They said T-Rex, which was very muscular, probably would have had red meat, because large animals with muscles typically have a lot of the protein my myoglobin. And T-Rex may have tasted like an ostrich, which I had to look up after. Apparently ostrich is red meat. Yeah, we've eaten that. I know we've eaten that, but I didn't think about it. Yeah, I think ostrich was a pretty good comparison. That's what I think of when I think of what dinosaurs would taste like. Either ostriches or like crocodiles. Yeah. Although some people think crocodiles taste like chicken, so I don't know. It does kind of. And so does <laughs> ostrich. <laughs> well, they also said that small dinosaurs, like other small animals that are fast and fly or jump, were probably mostly white meat. So then those would have tasted more like chicken. Specifically, something like Archaeopteryx probably would have tasted like chicken. Could be. We'll never know. Next, there's two new touring dinosaur exhibits called Dinosaur Time Trek Shark Edition and Dinosaur Time Trek Dragon Edition. What? <laughs> I was skeptical at first, too. So Shark Edition, as you might imagine, has dinosaurs and sharks, both prehistoric uh, and modern sharks. Okay. Yep. And Dragon Edition has animatronic dinosaurs and dragons from three different cultures. Which sounds pretty cool. So these exhibits are meant for families. And in them you can scan fossils, solve a race through time labyrinth, or use eggs ray vision mm -hmm. to see inside a dinosaur egg. There's also trivia contests. And the exhibits last about two days in each city. There's seven cities so far where you can see them. They've got Denver, Colorado, Sacramento, California, Little Rock, Arkansas, Reno, Nevada, Anaheim, California, Edison, New Jersey, Secaucus, New Jersey. The exhibits start touring the weekend of December 2nd, and then they move, it seems like, every weekend until mid-January. So we'll post a link if you're near any of those cities. You can reserve your own tickets. Interesting. I think the shark one makes sense. You know, you talk about dinosaurs, you talk about sharks around at the same time, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. The dragon one. <laughs> oh, I think that one makes sense because... It seems that dragons were inspired by dinosaurs. Yeah. Yeah, it really depends on how they tie it together. Yeah. Because you could do something really cool where you talk about what kind of dinosaurs were around in an area versus what kind of dragons they thought existed mm -hmm. and something like that. Or you could just go way off left field and just be like, dragons. <laughs> <laughs> so, I don't Both know. Both could be fun for families. I don't know. I guess so. So speaking of exhibits, Brevard Zoo in Melbourne, Florida is getting dinosaurs again with their exhibit, Dinosaurs Are Back. So if you're there, you can unearth a replica T-Rex and watch volunteers prepare specimens. 
the exhibit runs from November 18th until April 30th of next year, and it's open every day from 10 a.m. to 5 p.m., and it costs 3 to $4 in addition to zoo admission. Next, there's a new board game called Dinosaur Island by Pandasaurus Games. You can pre-order now for $80. Oof. Yeah. And it's supposed to release this December. The company raised, it looked like, half a million dollars on Kickstarter earlier this year. And the game is meant for two to four players, ages 10 and up. Lasts about one to two hours. Must be a really good game for $80. Yeah. <laughs> In the game, you build dinosaurs, and it's apparently similar to Dino Tycoon, but it's a tabletop game, which seems complicated. If you build dinosaurs, I thought in Dino Tycoon, you built a dinosaur park. Yes, but your dinosaurs can change huh. if you put money into it. So I it's think. like Jurassic World? <laughs> I actually never played Dino Tycoon. I'm just guessing based on those types of games. That's a pretty great game. Oh, you have played it? Yeah, it's like an old DOS game. It's basically a park builder game. So you put dinosaurs into little areas and then you get more visitors. And the more visitors you get, the more money you make and they can build up your park in different ways. Become a tycoon. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> if you have 18 minutes to spare, there's a preview video on YouTube that Oof. walks you through the game. That is a long YouTube video. I guess we shouldn't talk, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Before we get into our dinosaur of the day, we have another word from our sponsor, TRX Dinosaurs. So TRX Dinosaurs, we've mentioned before, does really innovative dinosaur art. There are puppets and sculptures and animatronic dinosaurs, and you can see the works in progress on their Instagram at TRX Dinosaurs. And one of the more recent posts is this cool video that shows a work in progress of an Oviraptor. We talked about the Oviraptor in our last episode, but there is more to it now because, <laughs> not really a surprise, there are feathers that are being added to it. Yeah, I mean, you could tell that there were going to be feathers based on the kind of substrate of foam for the tail fan, but now it looks like he's getting the feathers done to cover it up. Yeah, and it looks cool. It looks like a Looks like the feathers are going to be individually attached. Yeah. Which, it's going to be a lot of work, but it's going to look amazing, I'm sure, by the end. Yeah. I wonder what color it's going to be. Right now, it's all still white, but I know sometimes he dyes things. So we'll have to see what color it ends up. And if you're inspired by seeing these pictures and think, wow, I wish I had a dinosaur that was covered in individual feathers, you can send them a request for a dinosaur and describe exactly what you want, and they'll work with you to make whatever kind of dinosaur you can imagine. Yes, and they are also open to working with museums, so spice up some of your exhibits with these posable, affordable dinosaur sculptures. Yep. If, say, you're in an area and they just discovered a new dinosaur, and a typical reconstruction of a dinosaur would be way too expensive to make, or if you're thinking, we don't know that much about it, and what if something changes, then you could get one of these TRX-made dinosaurs, and you could update it later. Win-win. There you go. So if you're interested in ordering your own dinosaur, or learning more about these amazing creatures, head over to trxdinosaurs.com, or check out their Instagram at trxdinosaurs. And now on to the dinosaur of the day, Augustina Lophus, which was a request from Bradley via email, so thanks. It was a Sauralophene hadrosaur that lived in the Cretaceous in what is now California, in the Moreno Formation, and its name means Augustine's Crest. It was named for Gretchen Augustine to honor the Augustine family who helped support the Dinosaur Institute of the Natural History Museum in Los Angeles, and also the fact that it is related to Sauralophus. The type species is Augustina lophus morrisi, and the species name is in honor of paleontologist William Morris to honor his contributions to understanding hadrosaurids. Originally, this dinosaur was thought to be Sauralophus morrisi. It was described back in 2013, but a more detailed examination found that its skull was very different, especially compared to Sauralophus osborni and Sauralophus angusti. It was named Augustina lophus in 2014 by Albert Prieto Marquez, Jonathan R. Wagner, Phil R. Bell, and Luis M. Chiappi. Hopefully I pronounced that correctly. So two specimens have been found, 
A juvenile specimen was found in 1939, parts of the skull and limbs, and that was much smaller than the holotype. The holotype was found in 1943, and they found most of the skull and vertebrae and limb and hand bones. Augustina Lophus had a solid nasal crest, which is similar to Sorolophus, so you could see why there might have been the mix-up. But not much is known about Augustina Lophus. It was herbivorous and chewed its food. An adult skull was about three feet or one meters long, so it may have been a pretty big dinosaur. And there's estimates that it was 26 feet or eight meters long and weighed three tons. Augustina Lophus is a sister taxon to Sorolophus, and Augustina Lophus, Sorolophus, and Prosorolophus are part of Sorolophini. Augustina Lophus shows that there was more hadrosaur diversity than previously thought in North America in the late Cretaceous. And what's kind of cool is that Augustina Lophus specimens have only been found in California so far. In September 2017, this year, it became the official state dinosaur of California. Woo! And There was a campaign to make it the state dinosaur of California, and part of that, well, I don't know if this was official, but Augustina Lophus has a Twitter account. I think it's at Augustina Lophus. And the bio reads, Native Californian, Los Angeles resident, older than Jerry Brown, barely, vegetarian, firm believer in science. (laughs) Jerry Brown's the current governor of California, in case you don't know. And he's old. (laughs) (laughs) But not can. as old as a dinosaur. No. <laughs> and if you'd like to see Augustina Lophus, you can see it at the Dinosaur Hall at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. They have both specimens. Yep. As long as you know where to go upstairs, because it's a little bit out of the way. Unless they gave it a more central position now that it's famous. Yeah, I have no idea. We haven't been there in a while. And our fun fact of the day is that Cope's rule wasn't created by Edward Drinker Cope. So (laughs) Cope's rule is the belief that animal lineages tend to grow in body size over evolutionary time. And that's the kind of thing that you might expect from someone who studied dinosaurs. For example, in the Triassic, dinosaurs were pretty small. Late Cretaceous, a lot of dinosaurs were really big. Mm -hmm. Therefore, over evolution, they got bigger, one might say, erroneously. (laughs) <laughs> so it turns out that actually Charles de Perret and Theodore Elmer actually did specifically state Cope's rule. They didn't call it Cope's rule, but they did say that they thought that animal lineages did tend to grow in body size over evolutionary time. And a recent study by Benson and others showed that Cope's rule is wrong, to put it simply. <laughs> Basically, Animals don't just get bigger over time. They shift into different niches. That makes sense. Yeah, it's what you'd expect. While dinosaurs were around, there were many times when niches opened up for larger dinosaurs. We know how sauropods moved into these large mega herbivore (laughs) scales to take advantage of trees and other sorts of plants that were evolving. And we've also seen mammals grow larger when those niches opened up. But there have also been several times when dinosaurs evolved to be smaller. For example, birds. (laughs) All the lineages leading to birds seem to show this reduction in size. And there are other examples, too, where larger animals evolve into smaller animals if the niche opens up. So really, Cope's rule is sort of an oversimplification of a general trend that happened in a few lineages rather than an overall rule for what animals do in general. So, Cope's rule, not really a rule, not really made by Cope. (laughs) (laughs) So no Cope's rule and Marsh drool. Nope. (laughs) (laughs) And that wraps up this episode of I Know Dino. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so that you don't miss out on any new episodes. And if you'd like to join our growing community, check out our page at patreon.com slash I know Thanks again. And until next time. 
Thank you for listening to I Know Dino. If you have any questions or comments about dinosaurs, we'd like to hear from you at plesiosaur at iknowdino.com. And for more information on dinosaurs, go to iknowdino.com or follow us on Google, Facebook, Tumblr, or Twitter at iknowdino.